and welcome to this edition of Professor Messer's free CompTIA A plus certification training course. I'm James Messer, and in this edition, we're going to talk about motherboards. I'm going to give you an overview of motherboards, and this comes from the CompTIA exam objectives 220.601, section 1.1, where we're going to identify the names, purposes, and characteristics of motherboards. Today we're going to talk about identifying what we'll see on a motherboard. Things like processor sockets and chipsets and batteries and riser cards. I've got pictures and examples of each one of those things so that when you look at a motherboard, you'll be able to identify all of those things. We're also, in other videos, going to talk about other aspects of motherboards like architectures, expansion slots, connections, and form factors. We've got other videos that will talk about installation as well. On a motherboard, everything begins and ends right there on that motherboard. Everything on the system connects to the motherboard, and almost everything that happens is going to be happening on that motherboard. If you're online and you're looking at online forums and what other people are talking about, you'll often hear people refer to a motherboard as a MOBO. So don't be confused by that. It's just an abbreviation that we use just to talk about motherboards. It saves a little bit of typing anyway. T uh, motherboards themselves come in very standardized sizes. We'll step through what some of those are in a later video. But one of the things you'll find is that they're very standard, standard cases, standard motherboard sizes, so that whenever we're uh, purchasing equipment, we're replacing a motherboard, it all comes very standardized. Now, things in a motherboard are are in constant change. You're going to find through the years, motherboards have changed quite a bit. Everything from the chipsets that are uses, the speeds on the bus itself, the ways that we cool. We've gone from no cooling on motherboards to just fans to cooling individual chips. These days, people are using water-cooled motherboards and even uh, liquid nitrogen-cooled motherboards. Some people are doing some experimentation. Here's an example of a motherboard. This is one that I have in my lab. Now this motherboard is one that has multiple CPUs and different components. And what we'll do is step through this motherboard and get an understanding of everything that happens to be on this particular system. And we'll start with processor sockets. The processor sockets themselves are a little bit different from motherboard to motherboard. And you'll find that the, the motherboard itself is expecting a certain type of CPU connecting into a certain type of socket. So all of these things must match. Whenever we're looking at a CPU manufacturer like an Intel mother, an Intel CPU, an AMD CPU, those are different types of CPUs that will go in different types of motherboards. Now it didn't used to be that way. Early on in the industry, when these PCs were, were very young and there were a lot of different manufacturers, they all standardized so that you could take out one manufacturer's CPU and replace it with a different manufacturer's CPU. It's not that way anymore. If you buy an AMD CPU, you'll need an AMD motherboard to go with it, or one that's compatible with that AMD CPU. If you buy an Intel CPU, you will need a motherboard that will support that Intel CPU. When we look at the motherboard, you'll see that the processor sockets themselves are things we call ZIF sockets. These are zero insertion force sockets, which means you don't have to put any pressure on the, the CPU itself to install it. In a later video, we're going to talk about installing CPUs, and I'll step you through that. But in the meantime, I'll give you an idea of what these look like. Over on the, these are dual CPUs in my particular case. The motherboard that I have will support two CPUs simultaneously. It's designed in a server environment, so it's a little bit different than most. But you'll see that these, these metal arms are off to the side. When you lift those arms up, you can place the CPU gently into that and put the arm back down so there's no pressure on the motherboard. You're not bending the motherboard to have to shove a CPU right into that socket. It didn't used to be that way. You, they were almost like normal chips where you had to really push down to put them into those sockets. You don't have to do that any longer. The memory in a motherboard is a, a very special specific to the motherboard type as well. You need certain speed of memory. You need certain types of memory. We'll talk more about that in a later video. But you would just want to check your motherboard uh, documentation and find out what type of memory it's expecting. In fact, my motherboard even has written on the motherboard itself that it's expecting ECC DIMMs. So if I purchase any type of memory for this motherboard, I want to be sure to get that type of memory to go into this system. 
One of the things that we have, here's another uh, motherboard that I have. One of the things you'll find is that some motherboards have two sockets for, for memory. Some have three. This one has three. The one we were just looking at had four. Sometimes you have to put the memory in in pairs. Sometimes you can do it as a single SIM, a single DIMM, like I have in this particular case, a single stick of memory, we sometimes will call it. Now, on this particular screen, you also see another socket up to the top. This is an older Pentium 2 system that happens to be what we call a slot for the processor. We were talking about processor processors before, how they use ZIF sockets. This is an old style motherboard that has a slot that you put the CPU into that slot. You don't see very many of those anymore either. Chipsets are something that you'll hear a lot about, especially when you're looking at the specifications for a motherboard. And it will talk about the type of chip chipset that it uses. But what I've done is create a picture of really just a generic type of the way that motherboard chipsets work. Now, one of the things you'll find when working with these chipsets is there's a common name that we'll use for these things, even though the name itself doesn't quite apply anymore. You'll often hear the terms Northbridge and Southbridge. And that's because the, the, the Northbridge is the, the bridge, the CPU bridge to the CPU that's highest, the bus that's highest up and first off that CPU. And that bus between the CPU and the North Bridge is called the front side bus. And it's a very important bus. You'll often see it described in the documentation when you're purchasing a new motherboard because that's the fastest bus on the system, and it has to be. You can imagine the, the amount of traffic that goes between the CPU and the memory itself. There's a lot of activity that takes place. And so oftentimes, that's the, the fastest thing you're going to find inside of this system. In most North Bridges today, and th these days they're called memory controller hubs, but we often refer to it as North Bridge just as the, the way that we've done it through the years. Often the graphics card is directly connected to that North Bridge, that high speed bus also. That's very useful because whenever we start looking at video and what we're doing with video these days, it needs a lot of bandwidth. We need a lot of video processing power, it has to talk to the CPU quite a bit and to reference memory a lot. It just makes sense to have it in these faster buses that are in the northern part, the northern part of the bus. That's why we call it the North Bridge. The North Bridge is then connected to the South Bridge through an internal bus. And the South Bridge has, well, almost everything else connected to it. Your PCI slots, your expansion slots in your system. Your, uh, if there's an onboard graphics controller, perhaps separate from a high-speed graphics bus on your motherboard, it's down here. Uh, a Super I.O. chip that controls serial ports and parallel ports and some of the slower legacy type ports are down there as well. So you'll see this, this very common architecture as you go from motherboard to motherboard. Some of the different components will plug into different places depending on the motherboard. But this is a very common way of doing it. And as we step through here, I'll give you an example of what this is like. This North Bridge and this graphics card and the memory and the CPU, it's all connected through this North Bridge. In fact, most of the time you won't see the North Bridge just out here by itself on the motherboard. The faster CPUs now um, require a faster bus. And you can imagine the North Bridge is also running very quickly. So you won't be able to see it. It'll have a cooling heat sink on top of it or on how fans connected to that because that chip will get very, very hot. And you can imagine with all of the activity the North Bridge is doing, you can expect that's going to be a very, very warm part of the motherboard. The South Bridge itself, you can see some of these PCI interface slots I was talking about. This is the South Bridge chip itself. And one of the things you'll find when you're looking at a motherboard is the North Bridge is often located very near the memory, very near that graphics card adapter near the, the northern part of that motherboard. And the South Bridge is connected usually very close to where the interface slots are. And this is a perfect example of that on my motherboard. Let's look at an example of that then. If this is the design and the architecture of the CPU and the North Bridge and the South Bridge, how does that apply to real life? Let's overlay my motherboard with those CPU and the CPU connected to the North Bridge. And the North Bridge is there's just a chip right under there we can look at. And the North Bridge is also connected to the South Bridge. And notice that it, it is not only a very close to the components, the memory and the CPU up here at the top, the South Bridge and the in the, this case, the southern part of the motherboard itself is connected to the graphics controller and the flash BIOS ROM and the Super I.O. chip and the expansion cards. This is exactly how you'll see it on most of the motherboards these days, although it's not always this way. They may be in different spots on the motherboard depending on the style, but that's generally the type of thing you will expect to see. 
I mentioned earlier this BIOS, the CMOS, this firmware. You'll often hear it described as that same type of term as they're interchangeable. The BIOS is the basic input-output system for your motherboard, for your PC system. It really is in charge of making sure that your motherboard will start and that it will begin booting an operating system. It'll find your hard drives. It'll find your floppy drives. There's a lot to the BIOS. We've got a separate video we're doing just on the BIOS. The name CMOS comes from Complementary Metal oxide semiconductor, which originally was the, the actual chip makeup for the CMOS, for the BIOS itself and where it sat. Now, these days, it's not exactly that type of makeup, but we'll often refer to it as the CMOS. The firmware is the code itself that exists inside the chip. But as I mentioned, we often use these things interchangeably these days. Have you upgraded your firmware? Uh, is your C CMOS at the latest version? Is your BIOS at the latest version? So you, you'll hear those terms used interchangeably. And they'll look a little different on the motherboard. These are two motherboards that I have. And the flash memory, this Intel chip actually has written on the side of it flash. This other one's not quite as obvious. But if you look at your motherboard documentation, it will actually show a picture of your motherboard. And it'll show you exactly where those different components are located on the motherboard itself. The battery is something that you don't often think about as being on a motherboard, but that battery is very important. You see it as this round battery, this flat battery type these days. You'll see other types of batteries. It doesn't always have to be this very specific flat model of battery that you'll see, but it saves the configuration of your system. If you were to unplug your CPU, your computer itself from the wall, have it sit in a corner for a while, if it didn't remember what your hard drive type was. It didn't remember what your passwords were when you booted up your system. It didn't recall exactly the makeup and configuration that you have configured inside your BIOS and the, the CMOS that you've got set up. Then you would have to restart it every single time. Very early versions, IBM XT original PCs were this way. They didn't have a battery. And every time you started the system, you had to tell it what the, the date and time was because it never could remember. When you turned it off, it forgot what the date was and what the time was. These days, we just automatically assume that our computer is going to remember the date and time. And the way that it does it is it saves and keeps a little bit of power going when you turn that system off. Many systems these days have riser cards. Sometimes you'll hear them referred to as daughter boards. And what they allow you to do is add a little bit more functionality, especially more slots to a particular device. They're really designed for systems that have a very low profile. They're very short. And what it does is allow you to turn the interface card sideways to plug them in instead of having them plugged in straight up and down so that you can have very short maybe narrow type systems. Here's an example of a daughter board that's in the same uh, motherboard we were just looking at. So I plugged a daughter board in here. Normally, you would see the interface cards sticking straight up. But now that I have this daughter board, this riser card in place, I can plug my interface cards in sideways. And that saves a lot of room, especially if I have very tall interface cards and interface cards where there are, are ribbon cables coming out the top that I have often with, you'll see that with, with hard drive controllers. Well, this way I can keep the size of my system very short, and I can, can then fit it into perhaps a rack. You'll see that often in a data center where you have very short, narrow systems, and that's because they have this type of architecture inside. When you start looking at a motherboard, you want to look at identifying what the components are. And you'll so sometimes see a component on the motherboard, you won't quite be certain exactly what it is. Well, fortunately, we have Google available. And Google will tell you everything you want to know, probably then some. So on my motherboard, I had a chip. It had Intel on the chip, and then it had these numbers, GD82559. I had no idea what that chip was. But just by putting it into Google, I even put quotes around it so that Google would understand I'm looking for that exact set of of information in that order, it was able to find that particular chip on my system. I think that might have been a, an interface that drives one of my Ethernet controllers. Now, if you're looking at components and chips, you'll see that if there is, for instance, a serial port on a system, you'll see a chip right next to it. And you can almost assume that that chip has something to do with what it's next to. Or if, in my case, on this motherboard, there's a SCSI interface. That's a type of hard drive interface. And there's a lot of little chips next to it. I, I've just assumed that that's buffer memory. And if you go to Google and type it in, it'll give you more information about what that specific component might be. 
in review, this is what we've looked at on a motherboard. Now we know what the processor sockets look like, where the memory fits, what the chipsets are like with our CMOS and our battery configuration, and even how daughter cards and other components are identified on the system. Maybe now you can grab your system, have a look at your motherboard, start understanding a little bit more about what we have on there. For more uh, CompTIA a certification videos, some message boards that we have there, and a study guide or two that we've got on our wiki, visit our website at freeaplus.com.